Hi, Father. Hello, hello. <laughs> great today. Yes, it was great. Yeah. Was Happy awesome. to see you there. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. It really was. It was great. I was not expecting that. Oh, good. That's that's even better. <laughs> yes, yes. We had a lot of people. It's amazing. Did yeah. you? Yes, yes. We did a lot. By the time you guys passed, there was a lot of people who have passed. Maybe oh, well, uh, I maybe saw that about yeah. at least 40, 40 cars. Uh -huh. That's terrific. Well, yeah. We needed that. <laughs> yeah, <please. laughs> it was great. It was all in the joy of the resurrection. Oh, Amen. yes. Very yeah. much so. Well, um, some people will be joining us. Um, I'm going to... I'm going to invite you this time uh, to um, uh, silence, to mute your um, your own microphones, and and then at the time when we uh, decide to talk and and offer open up for questions, then uh, you will be able to do that. Um, in the um, uh, in the chat section, I uh, posted a prayer that we are going to say. Uh, but before we're going to begin, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Let's invite the Holy Spirit to guide us in this evening and to take our minds and hearts and to create an inner disposition of recollection in our lives. It's at the beginning of the week and we have things that we want to accomplish, or sometimes we have to face the patience at the beginning. But the Lord is inviting us to trust in Him and to abandon ourselves in His hands. So with the idea that the Holy Spirit fills our hearts with joy, let's say together the prayer that we find in the chat section. If you don't find it, um, we will be very happy to, you can follow along with that. It's the prayer for abiding joy. Heavenly Father, what a comfort to read of the prophets of old, who despite the difficulties and dangers that they were called upon to face, were able to rejoice in the Lord and trust in your never failing faithfulness. We pray that you, that like them, we too may receive your abiding joy and discover like them that the joy of the Lord is our strength and that the peace that comes from you is an abiding peace that enables us to overcome all difficulties of life in the power of your Holy Spirit. So fill our hearts with your abiding joy and that we may rejoice in life's circumstances, in periods of plenty and during those seasons when we have very little, in times of hardship as well as those times of great sufficiency. Thank you that we are your children and you are our Father and Sovereign Lord May our hearts rejoice in good times and in bad, and may your abiding joy and perfect peace find residence in our hearts as we rest in your love and trust in your unfailing goodness. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, we are moving here. <laughs> To talk about something probably uh, a little more uplifting, I know that we have been talking about um, the ascent and the idea of pain and anyway, many things that sometimes uh, en encourage our journey, but sometimes it poses a lot of uh, questions and the uh, idea that sometimes Catholic spirituality uh, is perceived as highly pessimistic because we normally expose the corpus and the crucifix and the Lord Jesus is suffering. And we talk about the dark night of the soul and the mortification and fasting. And we go through that in the uh, season of Lent. But it's the opposite. One of the things that the church always does is when the church is inviting us to uh, prayer and fasting and almsgiving and mortification, Right in the middle of those seasons, there are times when we can stop and be able to focus on the joy that we are going to receive. Uh, as you know, the uh, how many days we find in Lent 
yes, there are 40 days of, of fasting, but the season of Lent has actually 46 days because there are six days in the season of Lent that are not about fasting. It is about to, it is an invitation for us to focus on the joy that we are going to receive. And the joy of the resurrection of the Lord is something that fills our hearts with a new mentality, with a new capacity to embrace our journey of faith, not as something sad and pessimistic and sorrowful, but in the power of faith, we are able as Christians to embrace sadness and the sorrows of our own lives with a great optimism that doesn't come from just a very self-sufficient mind or from a self-sufficient heart. It is a conviction, it is a determination that is given to us through the Holy Spirit. And we need to understand that. So we are going to talk about joy because it is, that is the actual topic. It's the great subject that we, uh, that we have um, in the season of Easter. With the, resurre the resurrection of the Lord, uh, we have been invited to embrace this new joy. So it is important that we understand what joy is. So Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century was trying to define what joy is. Joy, first of all, is one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. If we go to the letter of St. Paul to the Galatians, it says that the son of the fruits of the Holy Spirit are joy and peace and many others, that you can read the whole list, and they are beautiful. In other words, is once the Holy Spirit fills your heart, it is natural for you to practice and exercise certain virtues that come from above that come from grace. So the Holy Spirit activates and triggers your capacity for your own will, for your, the powers of your soul to start operating under um, the patterns, uh, the spiritual patterns that come from God. And joy is one of those. So Thomas Aquinas in the 13th century was talking about what is joy. First of all, we need to understand that joy is a reality that is caused by love, he says. And it's something that you uh, feel and experience when there, you are in the presence of the thing that you love. For example, if I love my cell phone, I'm going to be very happy when I'm in the presence of my cell phone. I mean, if I said that I love my phone, then I have an addiction or something. But I'm, that's an example that I use it. But if I, for example, I love my spouse or if I love my children, uh, there is a joy that I experience while I am in the presence of the thing that I love. And then, <clears throat> for example, uh, uh, joy is also, is, also, is also something that I experience when, the, uh, when I enjoy the proper good of the thing love. For example, uh, if, what I, if I love my jacket because it makes me look good, then I have an aesthetic... Uh, 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 appreciation for that object, but if I love my jacket because it actually helps me stay warm in cold weather, then the good that I like about my jacket is not that it makes me look good. It's not only an aesthetic appreciation, it is that it has some utility that gives me and adds to me some good. It provides some good to me. So I experience some form of joy when I am enjoying the benefit received from the thing that I love. Now, that is what St. Thomas Aquinas calls love of benevolence. In other words, is when, and there's a love of benevolence is when you, for example, are able to love somebody even when the person is not present. And that is a, a love that is, greater than that. For example, uh, you love your children uh, and as long as they are in the house, you love them. And when they go to college or when they move away, uh, you miss them sometimes, especially at the beginning. Uh, I'm sure that like my mom, after a few months, you turn my room into something that she's going to be used, using for her own benefit and then forget about me. But at least for the first months, you are missing your children. And then, and then you realize that your love 
is something that was initially based on their physical presence. I'm going to love you as long as you are close to me physically. And then love evolves because now I have to be able to love this person even if the person is not present. Even if I am not benefiting from the physical presence of the person I love. And it happens to people that we love who have uh, passed away or people who move to a different city or people who um, move on in their own lives. And then you said, you know what? I always love you, it, uh, whether you are here in my presence or not. Thomas Aquinas love, uh, calls that kind of love, love of benevolence, is when I'm able to rejoice, to experience joy, even if the person is not around even if I am not benefiting from the uh, physical presence of that person. Now, Thomas Aquinas also says, the opposite of that joy is sorrow. And sorrow is something that I experience when I realize the absence of the person that I love. And because sometimes, or when I am deprived of the good that I receive from the person or, or, or the object that I love, and then, um, but one of the things that, that, that you um, also uh, experience, for example, um, when uh, you have uh, a sick children and or when you have a sick uh, uh, relative and you realize that that person is not able to enjoy the benefit of a good health and then you experience some sorrow and then you desire for that person to recover quickly. You are expressing your desire uh, for that good to return to that person. And then that, that love also, uh, that sorrow uh, expresses a kind of love of benevolence that Thomas Aquinas says that is very necessary. For example, when I go and visit somebody in the hospital, when I send a, a note to somebody to say, I wish you well, I know you are going through a difficult time, but I'm praying for you, but I am assisting you with my own intercession, with my own prayer. When you are sending your thoughts and your, uh, and your feelings to the person that is going through a difficult situation, well, you are feeling sorrow for that person because they are not able to enjoy something that they normally uh, enjoy, something that um, they don't possess at the time, whether it is financial stability or health of uh, grace of any kind of a spiritual benefit. So, and, and Thomas Aquinas says that is also called love of benevolence because you're just not concentrating on what the person gives to you, but now you are having some empathy and realizing that the other person uh, does not possess something that could be beneficial to them. So that is the experience of joy as explained by Thomas Aquinas in the Summa Theology. He says then basically joy is caused by love. It's the experience that you have when you are in the presence of the one that you love. Now, that is love in human terms. If I possess the things that I love in human terms, I experience something that I don't necessarily have to call joy. It's something that I call an enjoyment. I'm happy that I have it. I'm very happy that I, that I enjoy the, the, uh, the presence of the person or the object that I love. When I'm talking about my relationship with God, then I'm talking about the concept of charity. Charity is love addressed to God. And then what happens when I, for example, are in the presence of God? Thomas Aquinas says, if God is, if I love God, God is in me because God is in the heart of the one who loves him. In other words, is if I say, I love God above all things, I desire to be in the presence of God, I'm in communion, I'm in a spiritual communion with God, that means that God is my possession and I am God's possession. There is a relationship of communion and there is a spiritual joy that comes 
from being in communion with God because he is the greatest love that I can uh, uh, attend. He is the greatest love that I can desire. And when I am reassured by God's presence, then my heart is filled with joy because I know that it doesn't matter where I am. It doesn't matter where I go. I'm aware that I'm in communion with God. And if he is in communion with me, then there is a joy that makes me take any calamity, any difficult situation, any unfortunate event, I have the uh, reassurance of his presence. And that's the reason why we find many saints describing that what is the best definition that we find in the Old Testament for the reality of joy and peace is Psalm 23. Psalm 23 is a man who is in a desperate situation. And he says, the Lord is my shepherd. There is nothing I shall want. Even if I go to a dark valley, I fear no evil because you give me reassurance. So the person who's praying Psalm 23 is a person who needs guidance, is a person who feels lost and is coming to God and is telling God, you, Lord, you are my shepherd. You are my guide. You are my leader. I'm following you. And I know that sometimes I'm going to walk through a dark valley. I'm going to fear no evil because you are with me. Because I see your staff and then that gives me the reassurance that I need to keep walking in this period, in this time of uncertainty. And that is the experience of joy. That when I truly love God, it doesn't matter what I go through. If I have the reassurance of God's presence in me, then I know that I can walk through a dark valley. And that's the reason why St. John of the Cross describes this experience in, your, in, in our personal lives called the dark night of the senses and the dark night of the souls. And that is always in reference to God, not only in reference to the things that we have. Oh my goodness, I don't have my friends anymore. I don't have my loved ones anymore or my relatives anymore or the health that I always enjoy or the financial stability or the beauty that I used to have or the weight that I used to have. And then sometimes we lament this kind of things. And that we do that in a carnal, sensual way. But when we evolve in our own love, and then we start our consideration of the love of God, is that the possibility of not being in God's presence, if I'm not right now in God's presence, this is a living hell. Because what is the definition of hell and the definition of heaven? Well, heaven is to be in the presence of God for eternity, and hell is to be in the absence of God forever. So in other words, is joy, uh, heaven is an experience of perpetual joy, and hell, it is an experience of perpetual sorrow, because I am in the absence of the one that I truly love, who is God. So that's the reason why in the Old Testament, there's a beautiful psalm that says, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat down, remembering Zion. And I'm going to give you the uh, historical context, what is happening here. The Israelites have been invaded by the Babylonians. And the Babylonians killed a lot of people, destroyed the temple, left the cripple there in Jerusalem, and took the, be the, the, the best of the best back to Babylon and then used them there for their own benefit. And for many years, the Jews were their uh, prisoners of the Babylonians. And what happens is they were uh, trying to remember the glory of the temple, the glory of Zion. And then they composed this great song that says, uh, by the rivers of Babylon, we sat down remembering Zion. Our captors were asking us to sing a song. But how is it possible that we're going to sing uh, the Lord's song in a foreign land? Exegetes, people who know the scriptures, they say that that is the Jewish definition of hell. The Jewish definition of hell is not being able to worship God among Zion. When you are away from the temple, you are away from God's presence. How is it possible that we are going to worship the Lord if we are in a foreign land. So when I am not in communion with God, I am in exile. I am deported. I'm far away from the place where I need to be. 
And that's the reason why the human heart feels that dissatisfaction, the need to feel, I need to be in communion with God. And it happens when we commit a sin. It happens when we feel that we are disconnected. It, it happens when we stop praying, when we start blocking the channels of grace that I have in my own life. And then all of a sudden, I realize sometimes that God has abandoned me, but that sometimes I am the one who abandons God. But God never abandons us. You know, go back to the prophet Isaiah. Zion have said, the Lord has forsaken me. How can the Lord forget you? Can a woman forget her own child? Even if she does, God is never going to forsake you. God is never going to abandon you because that is the love of God. It is just natural for God to love what he has created, to protect what he has created. So it is not in God's nature to uh, kill and reject and, 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 and make his people suffer. What he's doing is just trying to embrace and sometimes allows these calamities and situations so we can understand the importance of being in communion with him. So, and the thing is, there are some things that are just natural to the human life. And then when we uh, face them with uh, despair, we can perish. But when we face them with hope, we have the capacity to reinvent ourselves with the creativity that the Holy Spirit puts in our lives. So that is joy. Joy is the byproduct of being in communion with God. And then that's why St. Thomas Aquinas says that at the end of our journey in heaven, there are two, there are three things that we are going to have, he says. Number one is peace, because we are in possession of the greater good, who is God himself. Joy. Why? Because we possess the greater good. And number three, silence, because there's nothing that needs to be said. Finally, we don't have to explain anything. We don't have to figure anything out. We don't have to uh, try to uh, fix anything. We have arrived. And this beatific vision is this reality that encompasses silence, peace, and joy. Something that we desire in our own hearts. Something that we sometimes wish that we could have in a more permanent way. And then when we see all these ups and downs in our own personal lives, I start asking myself, but how can I actually um, um, enjoy and kind of uh, be able to uh, uh, embrace uh, this moment of joy and this moment of peace and have it more regularly? So uh, it's a question that most of us as human beings uh, ask. Um, Jesus Christ in the, uh, in the Gospel of John, he talks about the fulfillment of joy. And the thing is, if joy is the byproduct of being in communion with God, and when I am not in communion with God, I'm in a state of sorrow, then uh, that joy has some kind of a progressive nature. And because so is our own communion with God. Sometimes we feel strong in our communion with God, and sometimes we feel that we are walking far away from Him. And then the Lord finds a way to capture our attention, something that John the Cross calls the weasel. He's the good shepherd. And sometimes the flock, all the sheep, they're eating in every different places. And when it's time to go, the shepherd turns around and whistles. And when he whistles, all of the sheep that knows the shepherd come back and they follow him on the path. So sometimes all the different aspects of our lives are so divided and scattered. And then something happens in our own spiritual lives. And it seems like God is um, congregating all the different uh, aspects of our lives. And then we experience some sense of unity. And, that, and we have those great moments because those moments uh, give us their assurance of being in God's presence, even when um, we have to face uh, times of uh, dispersion. So Jesus in the gospel, he talks about the fulfillment of joy. And he says, until my joy is fulfilled, until my joy is complete. And then he uses a very interesting image. He uses the image of the woman in labor. And they say, when the woman is in labor, that poor woman is gasping and panting and it's in pain. But when she sees her child, all that pain is forgotten. 
and she is rejoicing and her joy is complete. And she said, that's exactly what we are talking about here, Jesus says. I am going to go through a very deep suffering and we are going to be gasping and panting with labor pains. But then after that, when the resurrection comes, our joy will be fulfilled. Our joy will be complete. And then that's a good indication that the opposite of joy is not necessarily sorrow or sadness because then joy has the capacity to even embrace sadness. The opposite of joy is bitterness. And bitterness is when I am in front of my experience of pain and I decide to become a victim and then blame somebody else for my own pain instead of taking that as an opportunity for me to grow and become stronger. Remember what Jesus Christ did, and I have repeated that a few times in this series, is that when uh, the people were trying to kill him, he said, hey, you're not killing me. I'm giving you my life. And by the way, I want to take it back, which is a way of saying, even if you are suffering, you do not lose your freedom. Even if you are in a moment of anguish, you're not losing your freedom. God does not allow you to lose your freedom because it is, in, uh, it, it is a gift that no one can alienate not even the devil. And that's something that God has given to you and that you have to preserve and, 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 and even at that time. So sometimes it, before the reality of pain, sometimes we choose the path of sorrow and the path of bitterness. And then that makes us always try to go back and be attached to the moment that caused pain or the person who caused pain and then we're basically thinking about and fantasizing with the moment in which we're going to get, we're going to gain revenge, and we're going to find that kind of a uh, kind of a, a sick pleasure out of it when we see the other person who causes pain, suffering. That's something. That's the reason why we enjoy uh, uh, revenge movies so much. It's some, nothing new. The Greek theater talked about that. When you the uh, the experience of the uh, 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 the catharsis uh, in 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 Greek theater was exactly that. Uh, there is this empathy that you create with the character, and somebody is destroying the character, and you just hope for that moment when the uh, the wounded hero uh, finally will take revenge, and you take an ill pleasure out of it because now all the enemies are killed and everybody has been devastated. And now you feel a sense, of, a sense of empowerment. So many times we actually, we enter into the same kind of dynamics of uh, Greek theater because it's a human dynamic. We want to see the person who caused pain uh, uh, be able to uh, uh, face justice. And it's natural for the human being to, to feel that way. But the thing is that we know that although it is natural for us as human beings to feel that way, we know that that path is not going to be sustainable. It's not going to take us for too long. And then the path of redemption is when you have the capacity to even um, embrace your own suffering, knowing that your joy will be fulfilled, will be complete, if you do not lose your freedom in the whole process. And then that you know that even though you are walking through this dark valley, you must fear no evil because the Lord is with you, because you have seen his staff leading you, guiding you. And, and it is important for us to understand um, the beauty of that. Um, another thing that you find in the New Testament in relation to joy uh, is that many times uh, people have this understanding of joy as enjoyment. And enjoyment is something that you have now, but you cannot quite uh, capture and, 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 and grasp and, and grab and, and keep to yourself for too long. It's something that vanishes. Like, for example, we have a good time with friends. We had a few drinks, and I enjoyed that a lot. But once you get back home, that uh, moment, that experience is past, is gone. You have the memory of it, and you can rejoice in the memories of having had a good time with your friends, but that moment is gone. So do is enjoyment. So sometimes enjoyment is something that is not durable, it's something that is not lasting. Joy, however, is the byproduct of being in communion with God 
And as long as I am in communion with God, with the one I love, I know that I uh, remain reassured and strong and always confident that the Lord is my shepherd and he will guide me even if I do not know in which direction I'm going. And that's the whole dynamic of the doctrine of the soul with John of the cross. That he says, I'm just walking by faith. I'm just like touching. I know that there is a reassurance, a certainty in my heart, but my senses cannot really see in which direction I should be going. And there are moments of confusion like that, not only in our spiritual lives, but in our personal lives, in everything, in our marriages, in our uh, friendships, in our uh, uh, business uh, endeavors, and many of the things that sometimes in our professional careers, in what should I do now? What, what's going to happen? Uh, what kind of certainty should I have um, so I can feel safe? And then, and then the Lord is inviting us to trust and to be confident and to be joyful. And that joy comes from the reassurance of being in his presence, to be in communion with him. So another thing that in the, Old Test in the New Testament you're going to see is the idea of the sovereign intoxication. You are going to find some Paul talking about this oxymoron. How are you going to be sober and intoxicated at the same time? It doesn't make any sense. Well, it's a figure of a speech. It's an oxymoron. And, and the one who developed the concept, in a way, is uh, 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 St. Paul. He talks about uh, being sober in the spirit. And he is talking about not being drunk. And then a great uh, Christian author, a uh, fellow of Alexandria, uh, he took these concepts of he developed uh, something that in the uh, in the church fathers is known as the sober intoxication of the spirit, and many saints talked about that even Teresa of Avila in the 16th century. So, what is the sober intoxication of the spirit? Well, um, you know that when you are intoxicated, uh, when you are drunk, uh, and you are under the influence of um, uh, a, a different a different substance and what happened there is that sometimes uh you the operations of your own mind and the operations of your own body uh become different uh sometimes clumsy or sometimes you developed uh these overconfidence and then you normally tend to be a little more daring and in doing things that you would normally do when you're acting in your right mind so you got the picture. You many of you went through college, and I, I know that there are some uh, fabulous sto stories that probably is not appropriate for us to talk about now. But that's intoxication, and then and you see, for example, in the Acts of the Apostles, uh, the day of Pentecost. What happened there? Well, uh, they received the Holy Spirit, and they were speaking in tongues, and then and then and and they were praising God, and then in different languages. And what Luke tells us is that the first time he says the disciples were speaking in tongues, the word he uses is the word glossize, which means they were bubbling. They were just making sounds like a baby, blah, 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 blah. But the second time he uses the word uh, tongues, he uses the Greek word dialectos. And dialectos is an intelligible language. It's a linguistic system that... Uh, it has uh, uh, validation by a, by a group of human beings who speak it. It's a language. It's like English or Spanish or French or whatever it is, something established. So the uh, reception of the Holy Spirit moved the disciples from being this prophetic, from having this prophetic uh, 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 ecstasy, uh, this kind of a very uh, highly uh, expressive manifestation of the Holy Spirit to something that was more intelligible, something that it was a little more um, easy to understand. And then people say, huh, they were speaking in our own dialects, in our own languages. They were praising God in languages that they didn't even know. And then what is the apology that Paul, uh, Peter um, goes and pronounces in front of the other people? It says that he stood up and addressed the whole crowd. And he said, hey, Galileans and people who are coming from different parts of the world, we're not drunk. It's just 9 a.m. 
we have been filled with the presence of the Holy Spirit. So that is the intoxication, the sovereign intoxication of the Holy Spirit, that it, it, it begins like some kind of an infusion uh, of uh, something highly emotional, something that is not intelligible, and then evolves into something that is intelligible, tangible, something that manifests itself in very specific um, acts of virtue. And that's, that's why uh, St. Paul and Philo of Alexandria and many saints were talking about the sovereign intoxication of the Spirit. In other words, is right now in this season of Easter uh, that we are in the presence of God, experiencing the joy of the resurrection because the Lord is with us. The Lord is preparing for each one of us for that joy to be complete, to be fulfilled. And the reason is, we're going to see how there's going to be an evolution in the Gospels that we're going to hear in the system of Easter. The Jesus is going to start now. Once he rose again, he starts talking about, hey, I got to go. I got to go to my father. But it is not a bad thing. It is good for me to go away because I'm going to send you the consoler. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit, the one who is going to move you to the fulfillment of the truth. You will get to know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And then he's going to keep talking about that. And you're going to see chapter 16 and chapter 17, and they were all announcing the coming of the Holy Spirit, which is, is the, he's the, per, the third person of the Holy Trinity, the one who is going to move us into um, a deep understanding of who God is, who, who I am, and what the world is. In other words, he is going to bring us to a contemplation of the truth and a celebration of the truth. And in the realization of that communion that we have with God, we will experience joy. And then what is the definition of the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit, uh, St. Paul says, <clears throat> and, and many theologians, including Thomas Aquinas, have said the Holy Spirit is the love between the Father and the Son. Is this bond of love between the Father and the Son they love so much and they're so intimately united that as a result, that love is given to the whole creation. And that's why St. Paul in the letter to the Romans, chapter 5, verse 5, he says that the love of God has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. Now, remember that I began this conversation talking about Thomas Aquinas and the definition of joy. And he said, joy is something that is caused by love. It is the byproduct of being with the one you love. If we are in communion with God, then that is called charity. And that love produces a joy that is a spiritual joy, not a mere enjoyment, but something that is lasting. And then if I'm talking about that the Holy Spirit is the love between the Father and the Son, and talking about that he's not only producing love between me and God, he's also the producer of joy in each one of us. And there is a world that needs a lot of joy, let me tell you. Um, um, we counsel a lot of people uh, who have chosen the uh, path of bitterness instead of the path of redemption. We have a lot of people uh, who are constantly who are being hunted uh, by their own past, by, by things that somebody said or things that they said, by things that they did or things that somebody else did. And then it's a very difficult thing to reconcile sometimes with these realities. When I actually want to embrace the path of, love, of joy and then I feel the temptation of embracing rather the path of bitterness. So the resurrection of Jesus is something that allows us to truly understand the world in a whole different way. And the thing is, uh, the, the, the suffering servant that we read um, in, uh, on Good Friday, when we're talking about the prophet Isaiah describing the suffering servant that we apply to Christ, is a man who has not a human aspect. He has been beaten and wounded. And his appearance is not very nice. 
he looks like a worm. He doesn't look like a human being anymore because he has been disfigured. That's exactly the suffering Christ on his way to Calvary. But what happens is, after the resurrection, Mary Magdalene and the other women couldn't even recognize him. Because that disfigured person was no longer there. There was a new beauty that has been restored. The true beauty of God in our own souls, in the person of Jesus Christ. So the invitation that we all have in this season of Easter is basically that to embrace that joy that comes as a result of our communion with God. And, and if I feel that I'm not in communion with God, it is a good time for me to uh, start uh, reinventing my spiritual life and then embracing a path of devotion and be more intentional in the way I pray and the times I pray during the day or the uh, ways I cultivate uh, my own relationship with the Lord. Uh, the way I access the sacraments, the way I uh, study the scriptures, or I educate myself in the knowledge of the faith. So it is a great opportunity for me to let that old beauty that has been disfigured and then embrace the newness of life that Jesus Christ is bringing us. And because I know that if I'm in communion with him, the result of that communion is going to be joy. And the joy is going to fill my heart and it doesn't matter if I'm walking through a dark valley. I will fear no evil because I am reassured with God's presence. And that's the Christian definition of joy. And I could talk more about that, and I could give you a philosophical description of it. But I know that could be a little complicated, especially at this time of the day. So I'm going to open up for questions and comments and anything that you would like to ask. You will have to unmute uh, your microphone. Father, uh, I had a question. So you said something about um, not going back to that wounded moment seeking revenge. Mm -hmm. But in a lot of um, modern psychology and counseling, kind of, that's kind of a, a common trend is to kind of go back to these, these moments of bitterness and hurt mm -hmm. and kind of like confront that. So, um, can you, can you kind of just clarify, you yes. know, when are, when are we just dwelling on the problem and when do we just need to kind of so we, we may have to go back. We may have to go back. And the reason why we need to make go back is because one of the things that we do in our, our personal lives is um, at some point we were uh, placed before a situation and we have the choice to either, embrace, to either embrace the path of bitterness and seek revenge or the path of forgiveness and the path of redemption. The thing is, most of the times, a great percentage of the time, we normally go for the path of bitterness. And one of the things is that, and then the invitation is to go back. We have to go back. And that instead of choosing the path of forgiveness, because I would say somebody said something offensive to you when you're in fifth grade. And then you have been dwelling in that offensive comment that you heard when you were, I don't know, nine or 10. And then that event doesn't exist anymore. It passed. It exists only in your head, only in your heart, in the form of a memory. And then you have to go back to your own memory. And then you know that and place yourself before that event and then instead of choosing the path of bitterness and revenge, you are choosing that, um, the path of redemption. That's something that I explained in the first uh, spirituality series. What Jesus Christ is doing on the cross is, is he's, for example, he's doing, hey, um, uh, Father, why have you forsaken me? Because when you are in pain and when you are suffering, is in your own body and in your own mind and in your own heart that you're suffering, not in somebody else's. So you personalize the experience of pain. And that personalization of pain 
leads you to a very, a very selfish understanding of pain. <coughs> uh, but, but throughout our own lives, one of the things that we do is we transcend. And, this, uh, and to transcend our own pain is that we are not focused on the, on the pain that the person caused to me, but rather on the ignorance of the perpetrator. That's what Jesus did on the cross. He ended up saying, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. They acknowledge their own ignorance. And I said, it is not about justifying people. It is not about, uh, because people have to uh, take responsibility of their own bad actions, and they will be uh, liable uh, to judgment at some point. But that judgment is not going to be in my hands anymore. It's going to be in their own conscience, and it's going to be up to God. But the thing is, and, and that's something that uh, the, um, the Chinese philosophers, sometimes they talk about revenge, and they say that sometimes it's like taking poison and, and expecting the other person to die when the poison is all in you. So it's, a, it's the, that experience of knowing that I might be signing up for something that where the only, with, with the main, the, I, I'm going to empower the perpetrator by allowing him to, or allowing her to remain in my own conscience uh, and, and as I withhold uh, that experience. So what I'm talking about here is, is yes, psychologists can help you do that and, then, and to go back. But the importance of our faith is that these kind of a courageous decisions, we need the assistance of grace to be able to take the next step because it is not human sometimes for us to transcend. It, it, it is, uh, we, need, we need the assistance of grace to be able to transcend that and take the other path and be able to bring reconciliation to the own personal history. Thank you. Okay, was it clear? Yeah, it was great. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Any questions or comments? Hey, Father, yes. I like what you had to say about uh, uh, the uh, shepherd whistling uh -huh. uh, when we get distracted. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Really, I can relate to that, you know, just like he's whistling, calling us back. You know, he has to get our, get our attention somehow. But that, the notion of him, the shepherd whistling for his sheep and drawing them back. And uh, I, can, I mean, I can relate to that times when just, you know, we get diverted, distracted. Um, and he's probably calling to prayer. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's... Um, and, and two, uh, when I think about just the tendency to, uh, like you say, we can fall into bitterness over, you know, some kind of a, an offense or a, uh, something, some sorrow that we have experienced. Mm -hmm. uh, but if we're, if we're quiet, invariably he'll whistle, you know, he'll say, hey, stop for a second in the silence and, and call us back and say, you know, you need to just turn turn back and, and forgive or or ask forgiveness uh, absolutely 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 and, and the thing is now that you mentioned about uh the idea of the whistle that john the cross talks about that and um uh in, in spanish you call it el silbo um but the other part the, the other image that they use in the uh, mystics in the in the uh, middle ages is in latin called a scintilla and the scintilla is the spark and the, the thing is that the soul uh, prepares itself and is like dried firewood that you expose to the fire. And only one little spark can actually get that log of, fire, of wood on fire. So it's a very visual thing that the, uh, the saints use to talk about is that when you create the right dispositions, the love of God can set you on fire quickly. And then almost like you see, for example, you read the scriptures or you go to mass or you hear something about God or you listen to a beautiful piece of liturgical music and all of a sudden your heart is got on fire is because you have created the dispositions. Uh, the devotion in your own heart has uh, make that uh, firewood get very dry and then therefore ready 
to be caught on fire easily and quickly when you are exposed to any spiritual insinuation of God's love. So it's a, it's a very interesting thing, but it's true. Um, anybody else? Father, can you talk about uh, joy versus happiness? <laughs> That's a, that's, a, that's a good question. Um, so we have an idea of what happiness is. Um, I, I like the idea, uh, the, in, in English, of course, you're talking about happiness and you're talking about happy. And then it's basically is when being happy, uh, a lot of people think that is happiness is the state of being perpetually happy. Uh, the Latin expression for happiness is uh, beatitudo, uh, and 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 one of the things, one of the beautiful thing about that is that beatitude is something that is not related to the physical, temporary enjoyment of life. It's not like a, it, it is. It's something that is more connected to the uh, great satisfaction that we are gonna obtain in heaven. So that's why the consideration of your own death in the life of the saints is a very common exercise, something that they're not afraid of doing. And then, but because when we are here, we normally think, okay, how can I make this good time that we have together uh, and uh, stay forever? And how can we perpetuate this? And then the uh, close off on happiness for most of the people in the world is that they want to make uh, enjoyment the basis of their happiness. <laughs> and when they realize that they cannot really uh, possess uh, enjoyment in, 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 on, on a regular basis, and then they always have to find substitutes for that. So then when we understand happiness is, well, we do have glances of that happiness as long as we remain in communion with God, because if our destiny is to be in heaven with God, then I know that as long as I live in communion with God here, I'm gonna be this. That's gonna be a foretaste of my happiness in heaven. It doesn't mean that the Christian idea of happiness uh, rejects moment of enjoyment. Not at all. Not at all. I, for example, enjoy sometimes walking hiking and I enjoy being with friends and enjoying uh, a glass of wine or having a great conversation or watching a good movie. I have those moments of enjoyment, but I know that uh, that those moments are just uh, live uh, that sometimes um, that sometimes show uh, something that I that I that I, something that it in a, in a in a very in a very um, minor form uh, it expresses something that I desire. The microphone is on. Did you know that? Okay. Does it make sense? And and so yeah, so that is uh, that's that's the great very great difference between uh happiness and and, and being in, in God's presence for eternity. Uh is the perpetuation of enjoyment. And we cannot do that. Unfortunately, I mean, we try for many times, and and you can try. People try, uh, you know, uh, drugs and money and many other things, but it doesn't it doesn't last. And that's why uh, a lot of people who concentrate on the satisfaction of bodily needs like uh, food and clothing and and recognition and things like that, uh, they grow tired. They grow tired because they say, okay, I thought that it was going to uh, give me a sense of um, uh, fulfillment, and it didn't. And it's because en enjoyment cannot be uh, retained. Anybody else? Hey, Father, it's Lori. One of the things that's interesting that you talk about that communion with God being about joy because I often feel it's more subtle. It's more like contentment and satisfaction and feeling centered when you're in that, that, that communion place. So it's an interesting notion to me to think about real joy, which feels like bigger and brighter, you know, than, than just the sense of when I'm, 
when I'm in communion, I feel a connection in a very, very um, calming, satisfying way. More of a comment. Absolutely, because when you're in communion with God, and, and one of the things is uh, you're not in a state of dispersion anymore. You're not, a, a, you're not a scattered anymore. So we're talking about in communion with God is, a, is the, also the uh, integration of my own being that happens as a result of my communion with God. When I'm in the state of grace, I feel that my own heart is in only one piece. And then, as, as you said, I'm centered because what is the, 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 the main of all the commandments? To love God above all things. If I fix my eyes on that, then what happens is everything falls into place. And then I know how to love myself well, and then I learn how to love others well. And that's why the Catherine of Siena said in the 13th century, she said, hey, uh, the problem of the human being is a problem of love. We do not know how to love God well. And as a result, then we start finding substitutes and we do not know how to love ourselves well, and we do not know how to love others well. And then, because it is a problem of love, and, and, and what is the contrary? When, when we do not know how to love ourselves well, then everything becomes a manifestation or an expression of self-hatred. And then we uh, encourage very uh, tacit and subtle uh, forms of self-loathing. And then, and, and everything that does not express the love of God express, express is, is uh, Thomas Merton calls that um, uh, hatred in disguise. He calls that. And, and that's exactly what happens. And everything that I do that does not promote my communion with God, my communion within myself, and my communion with other people, then is going the opposite way. And it is, it is hatred, self-hatred in disguise. And that's something that it doesn't bring any affirmation. It doesn't bring any happiness. It doesn't bring any sense of satisfaction um, because I'm constantly um, walking uh, with a sense of incompleteness. Thank you. Absolutely. Well, that's a good question. Anybody else? Yes, Father. Yes, Jake. Um, what about the parallels of, of joy and happiness if we look at the joy that comes from asceticism? Mm -hmm. and that's not a happiness. Uh, there's no laughing. There's no what we would consider enjoyment. But from asceticism comes a joy. Yes. Well, the thing is that uh, there was a, a great group of philosophers in the first centuries, um, uh, the Stoics. And then the Stoics, they believed that through asceticism, they could control themselves. And these, um, they will reach a moment called the apatheia, is the imperturbability of the senses. In other words, is their senses are totally under control. And um, I can slap you in the face or you would not react or anything like that. I mean, it's an extreme uh, case, but uh, that's exactly what they were saying is, you're not reacting to anything. You have no sensorial reaction to anything. I mean, it's a, it's a very uh, difficult um, state to uh, reach, but the Stoics, they believe that. Um, asceticism in the Christian sense has a whole different meaning. It is not about your self-possession. It's not about your self-control. Um, it, um, it is about having the capacity uh, to um, cooperate with the Holy Spirit. And this I was is, thinking about the Desert Fathers. Yes, I, and I can explain the Desert Fathers in, in a second. So, and the Desert Fathers were, uh, I, I mean, we practice asceticism in the Catholic Church all the time, and Lent, we do that, and we fast, and we prayed, and we deny ourselves certain things, mortification, and self control, those kind of things that, that are part of the asceticism. It's, it comes from the Greek word askesis, which means it's an exercise. In other words, is God and you want to get together, and then God gives you his grace to uh, sponsor that intention that you have. And you will have to uh, make an effort to receive that grace. 
and then your um, that intentional decision that you make to remove any possible obstacle that could prevent your communion with God, that's called asceticism. And sometimes that requires that you deny yourself or certain pleasures because sometimes you love that pleasure more than you love God. Right. Or because you love uh, uh, money or uh, any other thing or any or your own comfort uh, more than you love God. And then and, and you protect this kind of things and then you're not loving God above all things. You are loving that pleasure above all things. And then that requires that you, in a very disciplined way, uh, try to um, re-educate your passions. So they will stop operating in an inordinate way and they will stop operating under the promptings of the Holy Spirit. And it takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of discipline. But it is an effort that we make uh, sponsored by the grace of the Holy Spirit. Because otherwise, it would be very self-sufficient. And that self-sufficiency leads to a, a sense of failure because we sometimes cannot do this on our own. So um, what I said is, yes, asceticism did that. And the Desert Fathers, they faced that challenge once we went to the desert. Because remember, um, and I explained that many times with the idea of um, the logismoi or the afflicted thoughts. The Desert Fathers in the uh, uh, fourth, sixth, sixth, seventh century, uh, they read the uh, passage of Matthew that says that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. I said, okay, if Jesus began his mission in the desert and he was able to listen to God's voice by conquering uh, the voices of the devil, and then we have to go also to the desert following in the mm -hmm. footsteps of Christ in order to become his disciples. Now, they abandoned the pleasures of the city and they went to the desert. But what they realized is that removing yourself from the actual object of temptation is not going to be enough. All right. Why? Because you're going to bring with you the memory of that pleasure. And that's going to haunt you. And that's why Evagris of Pontus he developed the idea of the logis moi. And the logis moi is the afflictive thoughts that come to you. And at that time, uh, the Desert Fathers were uh, guided by this, um, uh, uh, the Alexandrian school of, of biblical interpretation. So they use a lot of uh, analogies and, then, and, and the figures of speech. So one of the things that he did is he went to Deuteronomy chapter seven, verse one and two, where uh, they describe the names of the nations that Israel had to defeat in order to enter the promised land. And then they uh, allocated one human passion, one human vice to every single nation. And then that is the origin of the medieval teaching of the deadly sins, the capital sins. It's exactly that. It came from the virus of Pontus. And then they're talking about uh, envy and wrath and uh, lust and many other things. And then they said is, and the one then was the call the uh, Acadia uh, or Acedia. And it's the noonday devil, something that yeah. attacks in the middle of the day. And, 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 and they were, it's just when you are in the middle of the day and then you, I don't know, you have like two hamburgers and, and French fries. <laughs> you have to go to your computer and then or you have to go to a meeting at the chancery or something um, <laughs> you have to endure people talking for three hours about finances and then thinking about that you are in a beach in colombia enjoying something else and then and then it all you decide in your mind is taken away by different things and then you're totally distracted and you fail to be present and they, they talked about many of the different things but the thing is uh i mean a thought becomes a word, and a word becomes an action, and an action becomes a habit, and a habit can actually promote your holiness or become a detriment to your own personal growth. And then that's, that's the reason why you got to stop the temptation once you start entertaining it in the form of a thought. And that's why they created this uh, these, uh, um, technique uh, called antiresis, refutation. And the antiresis is that in which way the Lord 
uh, defeated uh, the temptations that Satan presented to him. Well, every single time they presented a temptation, he quoted the scriptures because he dwelt in the scripture. He knew the power of the scripture. He meditated on the word of God. And then every single time the devil says something, he poof, presented the refutation with the scriptures. And then they said, okay, while we are in this desert, we have to become acquainted with the word of God. We have to dwell in the word of God. And then we are going to have to um, kind of memorize and know by heart those passages of the scriptures that will help us defeat the devil when that condition arrives. So that kind of asceticism is, uh, is a very strong asceticism because it's not the asceticism of me not eating chocolate during Lent. It is actually dealing with the inner demons that sometimes whisper things to us uh, when nobody's listening. Those are the ones that we have to pay attention to. <laughs> the asceticism of the mind is way more complicated, but it's, an, it's, a, it's, an, it's a great uh, uh, aspect of our own spiritual life. Keeping custody of our minds is one of the most difficult things because that's when you start entertaining and having a little conversation. And then, you know what? I need it. I justify myself. Uh, I work very hard. I should get this. I should get that. And then once you convince yourself with some kind of mental gymnastics that you should uh, uh, compensate uh, with some kind of gratification, then that gratification becomes a habit. And then you're there. Now, there are different situations. This is a very general view of uh, the addictions in the human mind. Addiction is a very complicated reality because it has different levels, different degrees, and we cannot simplify this just by uh, using these kind of principles. But in general, uh, for all of us as, as, as regular uh, citizens of this world, uh, this is something that the Desert Fathers uh, realized in the first centuries of Christianity. And I don't think that we are that different. I think the, the psychological introspection of those analyses are still valid. Okay, well, thank you very much, Father. You're welcome. It seems like um, we've kind of involuntarily gone into the desert with this quarantine. <laughs> and, I, and now that it's what, week four or whatever, um, the first week or so, I felt like, oh, I have plenty of time now to be, have to practice spirituality. And then little by little, I find myself with myself again, and there's plenty of distractions, even though we can't go anywhere. So uh -huh. it's kind of interesting parallel. Yeah, and, and the thing is that one of the things that you did, uh, you, you know, uh, Cardinal Sarah has a beautiful book that is called, uh, in, in French, La Force du Silence, The Power of Silence in English. And uh, it's a beautiful book. It's an interview that he gave after uh, visiting uh, La Grande Chartreuse in, in France. The, uh, it's the only order in the Catholic Church that has never been reformed. And he had a friend there who died. He goes to visit him, and then he gives an uh, interview on the reality of silence in the liturgy in your personal life and so on. But one of the things that he says is that there are three things that we need to, and I keep repeating that in sometimes in homilies and spirituality series, is pay attention to the three S's, is silence, physical silence, solitude, and stillness. And he said, stillness is the ultimate form of silence. And we are always moving, always in direction. And the reason why a lot of people are not very effective and very creative and, 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 and have accomplished anything with this quarantine because they don't have the drug of the adrenaline. They don't have a reason to be moving around all the time. And then and, and they don't have the they don't have the uh, the the adrenaline that procrastination provides. They have time now. And then the thing is sometimes we realize that we are actually um, we 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 are kind of uh, uh, addicted uh, to last minute things or the idea of having to move in different directions. And when I feel that I'm not doing anything, uh, I actually value uh, or undervalue uh, stillness as lack of activity and laziness. And not necessarily. We have to learn how to cultivate good, healthy leisure. We have to spend some time and we know that our time with the Lord is not time that we, that we lose that we waste, 
that we squander. It is time well spent because we know that when we are centered, we even be, not only we become closer to the Lord and, and, and grow in virtues, but we actually become way more intentional in the things that we do. We're not actually just wasting our energy by doing everything at the same time. And, then, and, and I think that that's a lot of people uh, now that they have a lower time, they're not, it's not that you're becoming lazy, is that they don't have the drug of adrenaline that is moving them to uh, procrastinate or to do a thousand things at the same time. And I think one of the things that we have to cultivate is the importance of stillness uh, in our own personal lives, silence and solitude. Those things, we are scared of them, we shouldn't be. We should actually befriend uh, those three essences and incorporate those in our own personal lives. Any other comments or? I know we passed the time, so I, I really apologize. Um, well, uh, just to let you know, thank you so much for your attention. Happy Easter to everyone. To those who uh, dropped by the house today, we were very, very, uh, we felt the love and uh, thank you so much. Um, we are gonna uh, go back again to the spirituality series next, um, next uh, Monday. And then uh, one of the things that we're gonna do is Pay attention to the uh, uh, the calendar that we're having for the uh, parish online, the things that we're going to be live streaming, uh, Adoration tomorrow, the Lectio this uh, Wednesday, and uh, and so many other things that are going to be good for you on the screen. Um, uh, one of the things we're going to do, um, uh, we're going to go back to the regular uh, schedule this weekend with the uh, only one hour of confession from 3.30 to 4.30 of certain social distancing. And then there going to be a live stream mass at five and the uh, other live stream mass on Sunday morning. And uh, and Monday at seven, I will see you again uh, with my spirituality series. And if you have any um, suggestions uh, about the presentation or about the topics, Please do not hesitate to uh, let me know. Um, I know sometimes I propose things that are a little bit obscure and, um, and abstract, but uh, but we, we can break it down somehow <laughs> So with your help. So anyway, uh, thank you so much. Let's just finish with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. 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 Holy Father, we love you. We thank you for your love and mercy. Thank you, Lord, for Feeding us with the grace of the Holy Spirit, with your resurrection. When we are in communion with you, Lord, we're centered. We know where we are. We feel love. And you help us realize who we are in your eyes. In this way, Lord, we find joy. The joy that we need sometimes when we are, we feel that we're walking to a dark valley. We don't want to be and live by fear. We want to be guided by the love of yours. You are our Lord, you are our God. We want to fix our eyes on you. We want to be guided by you. And every single day, we want to experience the greatness, the sweetness, and the depth of your love. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. Thanks, Father. We appreciate it. Thank you, Father. Thank you, everybody. Good one. Thank you. Uh, this is being recorded, actually. We're going to have to find a way to send it to everybody for those who want to see it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Great. That'd be a joy. Yeah, it was wonderful. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Bye. Father. Bye.